Welcome to the Better Questions Podcast. Today, we have just myself, Dan Drake, and my brother, Andrew Drake. Our good friend, Chris Nelson, will not be joining us on this episode. This is episode number five, and today's episode is uh, a special episode. It's it's uh, something new that we've been kicking around and wanting to try. In this episode, we're calling an A and Q. Uh, you're used to hearing Q and A's. Uh, which is question and answer, but because this is the Better Questions podcast, we want to actually start with common answers and then provide questions to those answers. Um, And each time we do an episode like this, we're going to select a topic and then just start asking questions of that topic. And today's topic is the Bible. So uh, here it is, episode number five, an A and Q episode on the Bible. I think it's important to say up front that the goal of these A and Q's isn't to shake the foundation of these answers, but to provide different ways of thinking or different avenues of thought and perhaps critique and help you look at the answer from different angles. And so whatever answers we discuss on this episode aren't necessarily us saying this answer is wrong, but rather let's look at it from this angle and see what that gives us. And maybe there is a better way to address it and there is a better way to ask it and to get to that answer. That's our goal. Right. And with the Bible, I think it's important to mention that uh, every question that we're going to raise here isn't necessarily us saying this is what we believe. We are saying rather that this question is helpful in some way and will bring you down an avenue of thought that we think you may not have ever been down before. And these are questions that we've been asking and researching and just challenging ourselves with. And we think it's healthy to do that. And here's why. It's because if you never encounter questions that challenge you to think about what you believe and why you believe it, then your faith is resting on what someone else has told you. Well, I believe this about the Bible because this is what my preacher says. I believe this about the Bible because this is what my parents said. And now when I read it, I agree with their assessment. And if you never let other questions come in or challenges or different ways of thinking, then you're never able to test if the beliefs you have are just for granted or for reasons. And we're here to promote asking questions that challenge maybe what you believe a little bit, because what's the worst that could happen? If you believe that that everything you know about the Bible is 100% right, then you have nothing to lose entertaining a question that might um, be contrary to that. But what you have to gain is, let's look at all the things I don't believe about Scripture, and that will then like strengthen why you believe what you believe. Or it will help you discover a nuance to what you believe about Scripture that you believe is more true. And how could that be a bad thing? And also, it's just fun to ask questions. (laughs) So with all of that um, preamble out of the way, I think we should get into some A and Qs. What's the first answer, Dan? Well, it's commonly answered that the Bible is the Word of God. What are some questions that we can ask of the Bible is the word of God? Well, one just comes off the top of my head, which is what does the word of God mean? Because I feel like it's just something we all hear. Like this is the word of God. But does that mean a book that fell from the sky? Does that mean a book God literally wrote with his own hand? Does that mean a book God whispered the words into the ears of the human authors? Does what does that what does that mean word of god additionally in the bible itself you'll you'll hear it said like this is the word of the lord mm-hmm. or the word of god is a lamp to my feet but the people writing those things didn't always have a bible to be referring to 
So if they didn't have the Bible to be referring to, then does that mean something else is also the Word of God? And what, what is that? So is the Bible the only Word of God? Or is it contain words of God, but there's other sources of the Word of God, like through prophets? Right. And then this is one I've been thinking about recently. Isn't Jesus referred to as God's word, his ultimate word, right? Think about the opening chapter of John, you know, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John is doing something really clever in taking this ancient Hebrew understanding of word and God's creative action and God's creative force and saying that part of God became flesh, It, you know, like... What does if, that mean that Jesus then is the Bible or right. the Bible is Jesus? So what if, what if the Bible similar to John the Baptist pointing to Jesus is the testimony to the word of God, which is Jesus. And that's not to say that the Bible is completely human or not divine, but to say the ultimate true revelation of God is Jesus, God in the flesh and the Bible is, is God's testimony to that. That's a good segue into the next answer, which is that the meaning of Scripture is plain. The Bible clearly means what it says. Yeah, this is one I actually really want to uh, throw some questions at, because I think it's misguided. So just one question that comes off the top of my head when I hear there is a plain meaning to Scripture, I hear people say that all the time. There's a plain meaning to Scripture. Well, you know, I went to school for four years uh, trying to figure out the plain meaning of Scripture in a lot of my classes that uh, took a long time. (laughs) So just off the top of my head, if the meaning of Scripture is plain, why are there so many different translations? Right. How about this? Why are there so many different interpretations of any given passage? And those interpretations are compounded by how many translations there are. Right. Right. And I don't know if you've experienced this, but when you go to study or preach a scripture and then you've preached the same scripture more than once, but at a different time in your life, you come to realize that I once preached it with this meaning, but now I've seen a different side of it and I'm preaching this meaning. And if it was so plain, how could you have that multifaceted uh, way of interpretation? Right. And not only that, but I've even encountered people that don't even just get hung up on how to interpret specific passages from the Bible or even get hung up on like translations of said passages, but of the entire Bible. Like I've encountered people that told me that the King James version of the Bible is the only God ordained and like God stamped of approval version of the Bible. And my question is to that is like, um, if, the meaning of scripture is so plain, then how could we have so much disagreement, not only on what passages mean, but even on what version of the Bible is, quote unquote, the right one. Right. And when you say it's plain, what you're really meaning is my interpretation is plain, that you should see it as easily as I do, but you're just throwing out the window so many different necessary tools you need to interpret scripture. So for instance, I would ask, If it's so plain, what do we do with historical context, genre study, the disciplines of language, Hebrew, Greek? What do we do with all that stuff if it's just so plain? Because it's just a reality that when we read the Bible, we are reading a certain person or group's specific interpretation of those Hebrew or Greek words. And some of the things referenced within those scriptures require us to have a and historical understanding of that time period, or we need to understand the genre in which the author is using. And I'm not trying to overcomplicate it, but it it is a discipline when you're reading something that old. You have to put a little bit more thought into what you are reading. And that's not to say that there isn't any depth to get from just opening up the English and just reading. There's a lot you can get from that, but there are layers and you can use historical context, genre, language and you can dig and you'll always find something more. And that's, and that's what proves to me that the word is alive and active. Like it says is because the more and more you study, the more and more you find. Here's a couple other questions that come to my mind with the plain, plain meaning 
uh, answer, and that is, one, if there's a plain meaning to Scripture, then what do we do with passages that literally no one on this earth knows what they mean? Like, not a single scholar, no two scholars can give you right. the same answer on to what a certain passage means. In, a, in one of my classes, we were preaching out of the book of Zechariah, and my friend had a commentary by Martin Luther on the book of Zechariah. And when it gets to the very end of the book of Zechariah, it gets into all these kind of like ap- apocalyptic images. And in Martin Luther's commentary, he stops at the beginning of the last chapter of the book and goes, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> or something to that effect. Like Martin Luther just goes, I'm going to stop my commentary here because I have no idea on earth what is being communicated. Look, the the Protestant branch of the church proves that there's no plain meaning because <laughs> we've all split up on some uh, serious topics and some superficial topics, all with different interpretations and ways of looking at scripture. And I just want to ask, is it wrong to have a different interpretation? Hmm. What's What's wrong with that? That leads me to the second one I wanted to ask, which was, could it be that the ancient Hebrew and Jewish understanding of scripture is more accurate and they view interpreting scripture like turning a gem like looking at a diamond and as you turn a diamond or a gem the light reflects through it in different ways and it you're it's going to look sparkly and what those sparkles are is the light coming in and some of the light hits your eyeball directly and you see a sparkle but some of it goes out another way and some of it goes out this way and as you turn it where the sparkles hit are different depending on how you look at it. And so the ancient Jewish uh, interpreters would say the same thing in the Bible. It's like you can read the, the same passage multiple times and get different meanings out of it every time. And every one of those meanings is correct. And so my question is like, could that be a better way to look at interpreting scripture? Yeah. Of, yeah, of course. I think there's a rich history of, if you study the Jewish ways of interpreting the Hebrew Bible, they very much value disagreement. And this isn't a question, but just from my own experience, you know, the best conversations have pinches of disagreement in them, you know? And I you, disagree. There you go. It, this <laughs> just got way more interesting. You know, that's why we listen to debates. And, you know, that's why so many people watch Ben Shapiro uh, videos on Facebook because he's constantly, you know, disagreeing with people. That's not to promote or not promote Ben Shapiro. But I think that's why people like him is he's constantly disagreeing with uh, louder voices. And I think it's a value to listen to other interpretations because it gets more interesting. And when you engage with things you disagree with, that's how you learn, either by confirming what you already know or finding something new. Right. And by the way, that's the whole point of this show is to to bring unity to the church by saying, look, here's questions that I think we all could ask. And in asking questions together, even if we disagree, we can be unified in the asking. Um, coming to the next answer... Um, this one I think might be the most important one. And, uh, so I'm just going to dive into it and that's the Bible should be interpreted literally. Uh, there's a lot of questions that this raises for us though. Andrew? Uh, then how come Christians don't gouge their eyes out? That's my first question. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Because Jesus literally said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And I have yet to meet a Christian who's done that. Wow. And if I did, I'd be like, you cray cray. Yeah. I mean, that is a natural, (laughs) that probably is a natural place. But then someone would go, well, obviously Jesus isn't saying pluck your eyes out. He's literally saying to make a hyperbolic comment. It's like, well, you don't literally make a hyperbolic comment. You have to use, you know, your brain and trying to figure out, okay, what is he really, what, what's the thing behind the thing in this statement? And right. you have to use discernment, which is, oh, Jesus is being hyperbolic. But if you just read it flatly, it just looks like, take your eyes out. 
Right. And I'm glad you said that because Jesus, while on earth, primarily taught through parables. He told stories to get points across. And um, I don't think the people listening of the day were arguing about whether those stories really happened or not. They understood what a parable was and its purpose. But my question is, if God is Jesus and Jesus is God, and Jesus primarily taught, knew that primarily teaching humans uh, is the best way to do it is through story, then is it possible that God has always taught us that way? And some of the passages, even in the Old Testament scriptures, are more are meant to be parables and not taken literally. For instance, is it possible, just asking the question, that the book of Jonah has a deeper meaning when read as a whole and as a parable than arguing over whether or not Jonah was actually swallowed by a real fish and it was a historical thing? Right. And I think... The reason people are people are unsettled with this word literal or the question of is the Bible literal is because we've equated literal with truth. And it can only be truth if it's literal, but that just doesn't hold up in everyday life because we're constantly talking about things truthfully or referring to things as truth that we don't use literal ways of communication, you know, like through metaphor or poetry or hyperbole, exaggeration, story, you know, like literal infers like a flat line, black and white kind of way, but life is so much more in depth than that. And I think, Dan, what you talk about with the story of Jonah is a pet peeve of mine is we've got caught up with the literal understanding of was there literally a fish in the book of Jonah? Was it literally Jonah in the fish for three days? You can debate all day about that and you'll go nowhere, but you really should be asking, which is, you know, okay, just think of it this way. Every kid in Sunday school can tell you Jonah was swallowed by a fish, but how many kids are raised to love their enemies and to show mercy to those who persecute them, which is what the story of Jonah is actually trying to get across and what it's actually focusing on. And you have to view it as a story. And then you can ask, well, are we to literally love your enemies? That's a much better question than was Jonah literally swallowed by a fish? Right. And that also, though, on the flip side, makes me wonder and ask, like, if we aren't interpreting the Bible literally, one, like, how do we know where we should be taking it literally and where it is a parable? And two, then how can we trust any of it or how how do we how are we able to discern if like the most important event in human history the the death burial and resurrection of Jesus mm-hmm. was literal or just you know God using parable to get a point across about salvation in general like how do we draw that line and i think that's a valid question that is that is very valid and i think an easy place to start is just the same way you make Uh, that difference in everyday life. Like if Dan told me that his wife, Jessica, was like his second half, I would not go, you were missing half of your body for all those years? You know, I'd be like, oh, I I know what he's saying. He's using a metaphor. He's he's being poetic about uh, their relationship. And, you know, if, if I said, you know, after eating a large amount of nacho cheese fries... That I said, it's it, it's like my blood is filled with gringo dip. You you know what I'm saying. You're saying, oh, he's just exaggerating on the amount of gringo dip. And that just shows you the difference between us that I had to use an example of Dan being married and me eating nacho fries. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's another one. When it comes to poetry in the scripture and the Psalms, like, could it be that especially in a, with a book like the Psalms, more poetic, that were not meant to draw theological implications and theology on certain poetic passages because it's poetry and it's, it's human emotions coming out. Like, for instance, in the Psalms where it says um, that God knows every hair on your head. Like, 
I don't want to limit God and say that he doesn't know every hair on every human being's head. But like, that seems like such a trivial thing for God to waste his time knowing. I think more could that, pa- again, asking the question, could that passage be trying to communicate more that God knows us more intimately than we could ever even know ourselves? Mm-hmm. Instead of, oh, he knows the hairs on my head. That's yep. cool. And, and that brings me to, what if the Bible should be interpreted literate? Lee, as in using the disciplines of literature, meaning you interpret the scriptures based on the genre of literature that it is. So you don't just open up to the Psalms and start treating it like it's history, because it's not. It's, it's poetry, it's song, it's, it's prayer. Or if you're reading a parable of Jesus, you don't ask, was there literally a good Samaritan? He's using a, a teaching stool through... St- a, a teaching tool through story. And he's not talking about a real Samaritan. But then if you get to first and second Kings, first and second Samuel, well, th- those are narrative history. So you, you view those with, with a harder reliance on historical accounts than you would, you know, a parable or a story. And it, and you just learn to get to the why behind the passage more than the what, you know, you, you can debate all day about the specifics of scripture and good for you, you know, but it's way more important to ask, what is this passage saying about God and my relation to, relationship to him than it is to focus on the, the details of, well, how many soldiers were there in this battle and, and whatnot. Right. And I'm glad you said that as we wrap up this episode, um, I think that, In these kind of episodes, we can also try to settle on a better question that kind of sums up all of these things. And um, for me, I think it's it goes along with what you really you just said because, again, asking these questions, I don't want it to sound like we're poking holes in the Bible. Well, now now I don't know what to think, or now like I just shattered you know my whole world with the Bible. That's not what we're what we're intending because I still believe. That if you ask these questions and you start investigating and doing the research, um, that you're still going to find that the Bible is a very important book, that it is um, a revelation about God. It is a story of redemption uh, through Jesus Christ, our faith and hope and trust in God the Father and His Son Jesus is very much still intact, even after asking these questions we've raised Um and because one other point I'll just make is that one of the, the most powerful times in the church's history is in the first 100 to 300 years where they didn't have the Bible like we know it today, divided with the Hebrew scriptures as Old Testament and then the writings of several of the early church fathers as the New Testament. They didn't have it at all. Mm-hmm. And yet it was one of the most powerful times in the church's history, meaning that our faith is in Christ. Our faith is in the resurrection. Our faith is in redemption uh, through what Christ did on the cross and um, not in a book. The book is merely the revelation that tells us what God wanted us to know about that story of redemption. And we can disagree all day long about um, different interpretations and different passages and what they mean and how we view it, as long as at the end of the day, we can agree on um, the main things about Jesus and about um, salvation through him by grace. And so with that out of the way, I think a better question that's more helpful uh, for our faith than all the ones we've we've said before would be something along the lines of what can this scripture teach me about God? What can I learn from the Bible that will positively impact my life and the lives of others around me? What do you think mm-hmm. about that? I like that. And I would just also throw out the question, what is this passage trying to do as a good starting point. So when, whatever scripture you're reading, uh, I, I think it's always a good thing. 
always a good thing when you're using discernment, when you're reading scripture, that you're, that you're not just reading to read, but you're asking questions. You're seeing how other people have, what other people have written about it. You're asking your own questions about what is this doing to me? What is, what is this passage doing within itself? What kind of images is, is it evoking? What comes before? What comes after? What are some, uh, questions even raised within the text? What are some metaphors being used? What do those metaphors mean? What words are being repeated? Why are these words being repeated? And if you just ask those types of questions, which is, what is this passage trying to do? I think you put yourself in a better situation to not get lost in the the trees, but you see the forest, right? And you don't get stuck in these details, but you you get the larger theological message of of Jesus or of God within reading. your own reading. Right. I think those are two um, really important questions about what is the Bible trying to do in this passage? What is this author in this historical context trying to tell me? Um, and how does that fit into the larger story of redemption that the whole Bible is pointing towards? And then what can I learn from that that's going to add to my life that's going to explain to me in a fresh way what it means to be a human being, mm -hmm. what it means to be a child of God, that can explain to me how I'm supposed to impact the lives of others, how I'm supposed to live in obedience and service to our amazing Creator God, and how I'm supposed to make this a better world, and how I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Right. And if the Bible really is alive and active, like it says in the scriptures, then there should never be a point in which we go, we got it. I have conquered it. I have heard all it has to say. But rather, like those magical bags in Harry Potter that you stick your hand in, and it looks like, you know, it's only, you know, like a foot deep, but your hand goes all the way in and you keep going and going and going and you just keep pulling things out and you're like, I didn't know this was in there. And you just keep pulling and grabbing this and grabbing that. And that, I think, is what it means for the scriptures to be alive and active, that they never stop communicating things and you never stop finding because you're always asking and seeking. Always asking and seeking better and better questions. Well, that was our A&Q. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. It, it was a bit different, uh, kind of being on the flip side of a Q&A. Uh, let us know if you enjoyed this style of Q&A, if, if it's worth doing again, or maybe we should just totally discard it. But either way, it was great to talk about the Bible and to just throw out some questions. And I hope you kind of chew on these and think about them more. As always, please, if you enjoy the podcast, uh, drop us a line on our website at betterquestionspodcast.com like or, or share uh, this episode on social media uh, and as always please uh, give us a review or um, a rating on iTunes we would greatly greatly appreciate that thanks for listening and we'll see you next week <laughs>